At dawn on the 16th of July, 1945, a gigantic fireball, brighter than many suns, burst over the New Mexico desert, exploding with the force of 20,000 tons of TNT and fusing the sand to glass. After the searing flash, a giant mushroom cloud boiled 40,000 feet into the sky. It was the symbol of a new era, the atomic age. As the ground trembled with the force of the explosion, the brilliant physicist Robert Oppenheimer, the man who had led the team which built the atomic bomb, was reminded of a grim line from a sacred Hindu text, the Song of God. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The race to build the atomic bomb had been won. It had begun in 1934, when the physicist Leo Szilard, a Hungarian-born refugee from Nazi Germany, realized that enormous amounts of energy could be released by splitting certain atoms and setting up a chain reaction. Eight years later, in a squash court under an abandoned Chicago football stadium, the Italian Enrico Fermi, another refugee from fascism, built an atomic pile from graphite bricks and uranium. When Fermi withdrew the pile's control rods, he achieved a chain reaction. Could this be used to create a bomb of enormous power? In Britain, two more refugees from the Nazis, Rudolf Peierls and Otto Frisch, had discovered that a rare form of the element uranium, uranium-235, could produce an instantaneous explosive chain reaction of the type needed for a bomb. Fermi's pile produced plutonium, and this too could be used to make an atomic bomb. In the late 1930s, atomic research had been well advanced in Nazi Germany. Many scientists feared that an atomic bomb might be placed in the hands of the German leader, Adolf Hitler. The consequences seemed almost too terrible to contemplate, as Hitler's policies inexorably pushed Europe to the brink of war. From Europe to the Pacific, another global conflict loomed. In 1937, Japan had invaded China. Three years of civil war had devastated Spain. By August 1939, Hitler was preparing for an invasion of Poland. The people of Britain and France were steeling themselves for war with Germany. It came on the 1st of September 1939, when German tanks rolled across the Polish frontier. Ahead of them ranged the German Air Force, Poland was overwhelmed within six weeks. Hitler's blitzkrieg had begun. Ominously, it seemed that Hitler also had other weapons up his sleeve. On the 19th of September, as Polish resistance collapsed, he made a speech in which, for the first time, he referred to a mystery weapon which would place Germany in an unassailable position. Hitler's announcement sent a shiver down the spine of another refugee from Nazi Germany. In the United States, Albert Einstein, the leading physicist of the day, warned President Roosevelt that Germany might be planning to build an atomic bomb. Einstein wrote a letter to the president in which he warned that recent research leads me to expect that the element uranium can be turned into a new source of energy. This could lead to the construction of bombs. A single bomb could destroy a whole port and some of the surrounding territory. 
The United States was not yet at war, but the president responded by setting up a uranium committee. In July 1941, the committee reported to Roosevelt that in a future war, the use of an atomic weapon would be determining. Simultaneously, the British were working on a nuclear weapons program, codenamed Tube Alloys. The pace quickened when the United States entered the war in December 1941, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. British scientists joined forces with the Americans. Research was transferred to America under the codename Manhattan Project, because much of the initial work took place at Columbia University in Manhattan. In overall command was U.S. Army engineer General Leslie R. Groves. The scientific director was Robert Oppenheimer of the University of California. The two men were complete opposites. Groves was a hard-driving ramrod. Oppenheimer was intense, anguished, and humanist. Together, they made a great team. It was at Oppenheimer's suggestion that the New Mexico desert became the site where the bomb was to be tested. Oppenheimer needed a climate suitable for year-round outdoor work and a location remote from sea coasts to reduce the risk of attack. For security reasons, the area should be thinly populated, but also accessible by road and rail. It also needed to be sufficiently attractive to keep his scientific prima donnas happy as they went about their work. The complex built at Los Alamos met all these criteria. The Allies' most brilliant scientific brains made their way to Los Alamos. One of the scientists' wives recalled, I felt akin to the pioneering women accompanying their husbands into the unknown. At Oak Ridge, Tennessee, a vast factory complex covering over 100 square miles produced uranium-235. Plutonium was made in primitive nuclear reactors at Hanford, Washington State. By 1945, there were about 125,000 people working on the Manhattan Project at a cost of $2 billion. The project was shrouded in secrecy and maximum security. It contrasted with the makeshift technology which was at first used to handle the radioactive material brought to Los Alamos. Government contracts for the manufacture of the bomb were heavily disguised as research into solar power and alternative fuels. When the top scientists left Los Alamos, they traveled under aliases. In spite of its size and the number of people involved, no word of the project was leaked to Germany or Japan. Only the Soviet Union knew what was going on, informed by a spy within Los Alamos, the refugee physicist Klaus Fuchs. In the summer of 1945, a plutonium bomb was ready for testing. On the 11th of July, the two hemispheres of plutonium were taken to the test site, codenamed Trinity, in a sedan. The crew seemed eager to get rid of their strange cargo, even if they didn't know what it was. The device was assembled beneath a tower covered by a tent. It contained a hollow sphere surrounded by high explosive charges, which, when detonated, crushed the plutonium into a critical mass. No one, not even Oppenheimer, was sure that the bomb would work at all. On the 14th of July, the tent was removed and the device, completely assembled except for the detonators, was raised to the top of the 100-foot tower. While the device was being armed, Tests continued on a dummy unit swathed in cables. At 5.30 in the morning on the 16th of July, the switch was thrown in a control bunker five miles from the tower. Among those who witnessed the spectacle, feelings of exhilaration at a task accomplished was soon replaced by a sense of foreboding at the powers which had been unleashed. One of Oppenheimer's colleagues told him, 
We're all sons of bitches now.